I'm going to minister this morning on uh, the scriptures I ministered on last week. But first I want to uh, share something with all of you. And I, you know I believe this, and, and I don't know what you all believe on this. I've taught this before, and that is that because I, I, once in a while I hear people make this statement. They'll say that, you know, the devil hates you. And you have to understand something is that the devil doesn't hate you. They get that because of the, what the, the result of the fruit of his trying to bring salvation to you, the death, the destruction, and everything. But how many of you, have, if you'll be honest, how many of you ever hated somebody? Did you ever want any good to come to him? All right, see, the devil wants good to come to you. That's how you know he doesn't hate you. Because when you hate somebody, you never want anything good to come to anybody, to that person, to that particular person. And you see, you have to understand something is you to the devil are the means to an end. He's trying to rule through you. He wants to be like the most high. And if you understand that principle, then everything that good that comes to you, you'll try to discern whether that good is from God or from the devil. So if you think the devil hates you, then you'll only think that the bad stuff that comes to you is of the devil. You'll, ne you'll look at everything good coming to you as coming from God. See, that's the problem with thinking that way. And that's why so many ministries and so many church people get bamboozled because they think if it's good coming to them, well, it has to be God. But you know if it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's got the good side, and that produces death, you know that everything that good that comes to you can't be from God. And so you have to understand that. And if you carry that with you, if you, you'll be able to discern. You can't just hear me say it and say, oh, yeah, I believe in that, but then go out a week, a month, a year later and have something, have good things coming to you thinking that it's from, the, from God, you have to carry this principle with you. Then anything that good that comes from you or that comes to you or, or you think is good, you'll try to use discernment because that, you have to understand, the reason I'm giving this principle is because what I'm teaching this morning, this is a principle you have to carry to understand the principle or to understand what I'm sharing this morning. You have to carry that principle. Because, you know, we read the scripture last week, and it's in, I think it's in Galatians chapter 5. It says, we eagerly wait for the righteousness that comes from God. Now, immediately, you know, the denominational people are going to say, well, that's after we get to heaven. I, I don't know anybody who's eagerly waiting to die to get the righteousness of God, if that's what you really believe. Because if that was really uh, what they believed, then they would eagerly be waiting to die to get to the righteousness of God. And I don't see anybody doing that. And I see them fighting to stay alive and stay on this earth. So we know that it can't mean that after you die. We know that it means here on this earth. We eagerly wait. And it, the word wait is a, is a word that we hate because nobody in this country wants to wait, probably over the world, wants to wait for anything. We want everything right now. Isn't that right? Isn't that correct? I mean, make your children wait for something and see what happens. What do you, what do you have on your hands? When they have to wait for something, huh? If they have to wait for dessert, you know, rebellion. If they have to wait for anything, uh, and they certainly aren't going to be eager about it. Is that what you see in your children when, when, they, when they have to wait for something? Do you see an eagerness about them? They want it right now. I see the parents trying to... <laughs> They're not eagerly waiting. And yet the Bible says we're supposed to eagerly wait for the righteousness that comes from God. Now, if we can change that. If you'll let me change that, I can say we're eagerly waiting for correction. Yeah. Now, how many of us are really eagerly waiting for correction? Because that's really what it is. Because when God reveals his righteousness to us, it's not going to match ours. It shows we're wrong. It shows we're our error. So Paul writes and he says, we eagerly wait for the righteousness of God. And see, this is where, where uh, uh, this is why you need to know the difference between the good that comes from the devil and the good that comes from God. Because it, that uh, word righteousness or eagerly waiting for his righteousness, it's an all-inclusive word. It's not just our attitudes, although they're definitely included, right? But it's also in how we minister, how we lay hands on the sick, what messages we preach, what music is picked. You see, we're eagerly waiting for the righteousness that comes from God. How many of you that have taught, God, if you've ever taught in front of a class or in this church or anything, God doesn't give you anything until the last minute. 
Are you in a position of eagerly waiting for that? Yeah. Or are you in a, in a position of, I want it now? <laughs> <Please go on. laughs> These are things we have to learn. And how many people do you think go the good way and instead of waiting for the righteousness that comes from God, they just pick a subject and teach on it? It's a temptation, isn't it? You're hit sitting Sunday morning and you still don't have anything to say. You walk in the door and you still don't have anything to say. And the devil's always pounding you, do it good, do something good. Preach on faith. Preach on, you know, prosperity. Preach on, you know, family. Preach on hell. Preach on something. And you're sitting there desperately wanting God to drop something in you. See, we're to reach a point where we're eagerly waiting for the righteousness of God. <laughs> sure. I saw a picture of a dog, and you know how they'll put a snack or something on their nose, and they'll say, wait, wait, and that dog is just crazy, wait, and you see some of those dogs that will wait forever, and the master says, no, that thing's gone just like that, and I saw that this morning, that's what God's doing, he's like, he gives us these things, and he's like, wait, wait, and you're eager, he's like, I want to go, I want to go, but you have to wait till he says. We used to... We did that with our dogs. We'd put our, like when I eat tuna or anything, there'd be some left, and I always drop a bite in, and I'd put it down, and he knows it's his. And he'd sit there, and this drool would just, and he, was, I, we all, he couldn't take it until we said, okay. And, and the drool would just, just, I mean, like a waterfall would come out of his mouth. But boy, he's just, listen, he's intently fixed, waiting for your word. I mean, he's looking, you get up and walk, and he follows wherever you go, waiting for you to say, okay. Huh? Yeah, and the the minute you say okay, (laughs) just like you say, man, but he knows he couldn't take it until you said okay. And that's a good illustration to use. That's what we're waiting on God for, whether it be laying hands on the sick, and this, is, and this is why ministry has left so many broken people, yes. is because we've not waited for the righteousness that comes from God. We have decided on our own to move out in front of God using this letter and our own compassion. I'm not saying everybody's doing it uh, with a bad motivation, um, although it is putting man first, and that's a bad motivation. But they've not waited for the righteousness of God and because it's so difficult to wait. You see people, they have hurts, they have needs. Jesus did too, but he waited. Listen, he went 30 years before he started ministering. You don't think he saw anything, any unrighteousness that was going on, any unjustness that was going on, sick people, lepers. You don't think he saw any of that? But what was he doing? He was waiting eagerly for the righteousness that came from God. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And we have to understand that in ministry is that when I say, when I read that scripture last week, it's an all-inclusive word. It's not just changing our attitudes, although we definitely want our attitudes changed, but it's in everything that we do. We're eagerly waiting for the righteousness of God. Every decision that you make has to be based upon the righteousness, eagerly waiting for his righteousness. And... We have to understand, uh, um, uh, for instance, deliverance services. How many, how many deliverance ministries are there? And they loved, I mean, I've seen people get delivered week after week after week after work, week and never get delivered. Why? Because we're not waiting for the righteousness that comes from God. We, and, and again, uh, I want to read a, well, jeez, i got so many scriptures, I don't even know how, where to even start. I mean, I, I don't have a lot, I just don't know what order to put them in. Yeah, let's go to Galatians. <clears throat> I'm going to read that scripture again. It's in chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness 
for which we hope. Now, flip down here to 13, and he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Now, what does that, why did he put that right there? Because at the same time we're eagerly waiting, we don't want to use that as an excuse to fulfill our, to fulfill our flesh. In other words, I don't want to sit around my whole life eagerly waiting for something that I'm not trying to get to. You know what I mean? In other words, I can use that as an excuse not to do anything. Because I can say, well, I'm eagerly waiting. In other words, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to pray for people. I'm not, we're not going to do anything because we're eagerly, we're just waiting for God to come down and do it. And that's what Paul is saying there because that's an indulgence of the flesh. Because it gives you the, the ability to use that scripture and not do anything. But our job is, you know, the scripture says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. Did you know that? It says those that are in the flesh cannot please God. You're familiar with that scripture. And yet you've got all kinds of ministries out there saying, oh, we're already pleasing to God. Not if you're in the flesh. Because what did I teach you last week? Is we have to get in Christ. Yeah, Christ is already in you. But that's not the same thing as you being in Christ. And that's where the mistake has been made, or one of them, one of the many, is that we have thought those were synonymous terms. Well, if he's in me, then I'm in him. No, 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 no. Just because he's in you doesn't mean you're in him. And I shared with you last week, I gave you this illustration. Can you commit adultery in him? If you're in him, you can't commit adultery, but you can while he's in you. You can be offended with him in you, but if you're in him, you can't be offended. Turn with me to John, John's epistle, first one. Nowhere does it say in Scripture that you're righteous because he's in you. He says you're righteous because you are in him, if you get in him. It's John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John, I said John's epistle. Not John's gospel, John's epistle. This is why John could be so bold in what he said. He said, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Chapter 2. I'm sorry. 1 John 1, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 3. We know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commands, whoever says I know him but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are what? In him. Not him in us, in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live what? In him. in him must live as Jesus did. See, when we're in him, we'll live it. So if you're going to live as Jesus did, how are you going to be offended? How are you going to commit adultery? How are you going to have outbursts of wrath? How are you going to lust? See, that was the key, was we were supposed to be in him. And that's what we're trying to get. Notice it said, we eagerly await by what? By faith. Why is it impossible to please God without faith? Because it's the voice of God that will cause us to, become, to get in Him. Without that, there's no way you can obtain righteousness without His voice. And that's why we're so desperate in this church to hear Him speak. Whether it's through song, whether it's through prayer, whether it's through prophetic words, prophetic music, whatever it is, we're desiring to hear Him speak because that's the only way we can eagerly await and gain the righteousness of that is from God. That's why he says to seek his righteousness. That's why he says to seek his justification. See, you're saved by grace. What is grace? Jesus gets in you and he empowers you now to get into him. Which is really getting into who? The Father. 
He empowers us to do that. Listen, these are things you're going to have to know because there's a whole lot of false stuff out there that's being preached that's causing people shipwreck. It's causing people to get in. You know, I said, talked about the, the trail of broken people. They end up being in more captivity than they were before they came. And that's what's happening to people. And so we eagerly wait for the righteousness that comes from God. And this is the other scripture I read. This was in 2 Corinthians. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just read it because you should have had it from last week. I hope you do. Um... Yeah, I guess I'll just read in verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I've heard people teach many times that because Christ is in you, you're in him. No, that's not true. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible says by faith now we have to get in him. It's by faith that we hear his voice and obey, and that way we move into him. And that's why we don't use our liberty as a starting point for the flesh. We use our liberty, what for? To hear God's voice so that we can lose our flesh. And so you have to understand that when the Scriptures talks about we eagerly wait for the righteousness that comes from God, see, the devil's trying to give us righteousness as well, but he tries to shortcut it. And that's why Paul was talking to those Galatians. We talked about that Wednesday night. And he said, who has bewitched you? He says, he says, I marvel that you're turning away so quickly from the one who called you. I want to read that too. Mine says, uh, NIV says, astonished. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. The New King James says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the, cop- uh, the gospel of Christ. Now, notice in the NIV it says, are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. So think of how much has been taught in American church that is really no gospel at all. And, and that's when, What? Yeah, which means good news, which uh, think about it. And then Paul goes into, and he says twice, he says, if anybody, and look, I love this, this here. It says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be un, under, let them be accursed, or let NIV says be under God's curse. Tell me, who's going to turn down an angel in America? Paul's pretty bold in saying that, isn't he? How many of you have ever had angelic, you know, you've seen angels, you know, you've seen them. What if he comes preaching to you another gospel? How could Paul be so bold in what he's saying that my gospel will be better than anything an angel can tell you? How can Paul say that? (laughs) Because if we read Galatians, and you know my teaching on this, how did Paul get the revelation of who Jesus was. By reading, yeah, (laughs) knocked him off his horse. (laughs) We have a joke here, and we learned it, yeah, from another ministry, is that, you know, it's always, and you see pictures of it in the Bible of Paul falling off his horse. Excuse me, the story is horseless. There is no horse in the story. He's not riding a horse. Religion uh, put that in there because they didn't want you to know that you could be fall under the power of God. We've got other scriptures that verify that. You know, the priest couldn't stand to minister when the glory of the Lord came into the temple in the Old Testament. They couldn't stand, and that means they couldn't stand up. And so religion wants to take you uh, take away from, from falling in the Spirit, and uh, so, they, so they threw a horse in the story. 
Because if you read it, it says, if you read it, it says he took Paul by the hand and led him into town. Well, why wouldn't you put him back on the horse and lead the horse? Why would you make a guy blind walk with a, Why would you do that? If you had a horse available, just put him back on the horse and lead the horse in. But see, it doesn't say that. It says let him by the hand because he wasn't on a horse. But religion loves to believe all that idiocy. And that's what I mean. We put things in here that aren't in here. And it puts people in captivity. Yes. And so he, it, it, Paul went out and he got the revelation of who Jesus was. And you know my teaching on that? He, didn't, he said it, he wasn't taught it by man and it, it, he didn't refer to others. And this is one of the reasons that I preach so much about books. What, what do books do for most people? I'm not saying books are wrong, but most people do it. What for? To shortcut. Yeah. One of the things we have, this is what we're doing here, is we're trying to figure out, this is what the devil always wants to do. He either wants to put you first or people first in your life. That's what you have to discern. That's what, exactly, that's 666, that's what Babylon is, is you're putting man first. Does that sound good, though? Absolutely, that sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds caring, and that's why Paul says, if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of God. And that's, what the, that's what I love about Jesus. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a powerful statement if you understand it because, you see, most people in church are trying to please men. They don't come to the service to please God. They go to please themselves or other people. That's why so many people are hungry for ministry. Why do you think so many people are hungry? I'm not saying that they, they, their motivation isn't want to help people, but why do you think they're, motiv uh, they're motivated so much to get in ministry? It's because they want to help man. See, our church, what do we want to do? We love ministry too. But who are we ministering to? We want to minister unto God. See, you minister unto God first. And you always keep that first and foremost in front of you. And then, through that, you will minister correctly to man. In other words, man won't have rule and control over you. You wonder why we have so much uh, persecution? Why there's so much accusation of me or Kathy or of our church? What is that designed to do? It's designed to get us to defend ourselves, to put us first. That's why people make accusation. It's one of the things I love about Jesus is you read through, all throughout the, 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 uh, the uh, Gospels and you find people trying to either make him think, put him first or to put them first. And he never yields. That's why he was hung on the cross. Because the devil wants to rule through man. He wants to obtain, he wants to be like the most high. And he wants to rule and try to bring salvation to man, man's way, not God's way. Through man's stuff. You know this is true. How many of you thought when you bought your new car that was going to give you deliverance, freedom, joy, soul peace? When you went on your vacation, you were going to get deliverance, soul peace, everything that salvation represents. And so you and I have to learn how to walk seven days a week, not putting ourselves first or other people first, because the devil will use anything. Use your business. He'll use your family. Why do you think your family invites you places on Sunday? What do you think that is? Trying to make you choose you first. Choose them first. And as long as the devil has you choosing man first, he's got you. It's getting quite quiet in here. See, how many of you ever had a boss? They didn't hate you but they used you for a means to an end. They didn't hate you. They didn't care for you either. And sometimes they'll give you good stuff to make you do something to enhance them. You ever had bosses like that? Or where, do you, huh? where do you think that comes from? Where do you think that principle comes from? 
They don't hate you. So don't ever think the devil hates you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. But he wants to use you as a means to an end, just like those bosses do, because that's the principle. You ever had a boss that actually cared about you? That would actually lay their life down for you, for your betterment? Those are rare. They're like hen's teeth. But they're a joy to work for. Well, we've got one. Right in here. He gave his life for ours. In obedience to his father. That's why it's important that people understand that. I looked on the internet this morning about, so I wrote in songs that, ha that have, he was thinking about me on the cross. Then I wrote songs where he died in obedience to the cross. You know why? Because it's all about me. It's all about us. <laughs> you know that's dumb anyway, because when he went, first went into the garden, does he act like he really wants to die for you? <laughs> what did he say? He said, if there's any other way. What was he being tempted with? To think of what? Think of himself. And he got in that garden, and what did he wait for? He waited for the righteousness that came from God. And he got it under control, and when he comes out of that garden... He's no longer thinking about himself. Yes, I know the scripture does say that he died for us. Yeah, but you were second, not first. And that's the part that's always left out. He died in obedience to his father. If God would have told him to destroy the world, God wouldn't do that. But if God had told him to, that's what he'd have done. Because he's obedient to his father. I simply use that as a shock value. God would never say that. But I'm just saying, he went in obedience to his father. He wasn't thinking of you on the cross. He was thinking of his father. And quit thinking all this stuff is about us because when you put man first, the devil's got you, especially in ministry. We have to be careful with the things that we teach, the things that we, the, everything that we do is we're trying to get, we're eagerly waiting for the righteousness of God to speak. And sometimes God will give me stuff two weeks in advance. That's fun. Almost. Because sometimes you can wear yourself out with it and then it doesn't come out as good. And then other times he'll give me stuff after I get up here. As I'm speaking, I'll have two or three, four sentences, maybe a scripture. And then all of a sudden things come, and then you guys start adding in. But you have to eagerly wait for that. You can't be in stress. You can't be in anxiety. You can't be in fear. What if I don't have anything? See, to get up here and say I don't have anything, I'm actually thinking of God, I'm actually thinking of God and you at the same time. To try to fake it, you know what, fake it till you make it? You ever heard of that? Fake it till you make it. You know what that means? That means we're putting you first over God. Because we're yielding to the fakery rather than to the Spirit of God Himself. And we have to watch out for humanism in everything that we listen to because you see the voice of, of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom is in Babylon. You can hear people preach good things, but they're still putting man first. You have to rearrange it. Have you ever had to do that and put God first in what they're saying? I always try to read scripture by putting God first. Now, I know there's some scriptures that you can't do that, like, you know, adultery scriptures and things like that. But you take a scripture like the love chapter in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How many people think, just, they, ought, they never apply that to God. They just automatically apply it to people. Apply it to God sometime. Yes.
Okay, so I'm thinking about the number six, and that's the number of man. Mm -hmm. And what's that verse that says, let us move on to perfection? How does that verse go? Going on to perfection. Mm -hmm. The number seven is the number of perfection, right? And so number six is almost mm -hmm. to seven, yeah. but it's not seven. It's not seven. And a lot of times we settle, just like you're saying, it's like we haven't really heard anything yet, and we'll settle and we'll preach something good, or we'll just rest on our gifting yeah. and let our gifting do what it needs to be done. Where six, it looks really, really all close to seven. It's almost seven, but it's not seven. I remember one time we, we went to a conference and there was a minister there and he said, there was people doing a bunch of fleshly stuff and <clears throat> Kathy and I are just sitting there, you know, watching and, and, they, they, and they, they knew that people were looking at this, recognizing what was going on and they said, well, it may only be 10% God, but that's probably 10% more than you have. And I thought, now see, you're already saying that 10% is good enough. It's almost. Not even. That's not even close. Not even. Even if he'd said 90%, yeah. you, that, that's close. But he was saying 10. And we were supposed to feel bad. Which brings me to another deal, uh, concept, is that those kind of statements right there are the... Uh, remember when I read to you, we're eagerly waiting for the righteousness. And I said, so we're eagerly waiting for a correction? See, there's a correction that comes from the enemy to get you to think of yourself first. A statement like, you're so spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. What is that designed to get you to do? Not to be so spiritual. Think of yourself. And that, that statement about the 10%, what was that designed to do? Well, let's be satisfied with 10%. All this stuff, I don't have to go to church. We had that shared. Well, you, don't have to go, you don't even have to read your Bible. Who's that designed to think of? We've been told that. By minute, people that are preaching that have said that to us. You don't have to read your Bible because you have Christ in you. Yeah, but I need to get in Him, and that's why I read my Bible. You know, the Bible talks about what happens to people who have Christ in them and do nothing with Him. Are you familiar with them? Hmm? Well, that, He never knew them, but it says, it says, you'll die. The law says you'll die on the testimony of two or three witnesses. It says, how much worse punishment do you think he will be thought worthy <clears throat> who has taken the Son of God into him and counted him as a common thing and counted the blood of the covenant as a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? That doesn't sound good to me. Yeah, we can also take the Scripture to all the ones that say, I know him, and, and Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You never waited for the righteousness that comes from me. You took this upon yourself and started ministering without waiting for me. Man loves to be ministered to. It says that in here too. The priests rule by whose power? And my people love to have it so. We love to be ministered to. And I'm not taking ministering to you out of the deal. You know that, right? I'm not saying we're not to be ministered to. I'm not saying man doesn't have a place. I'm saying man has second place. I told you one time that man is number two. That's what he is. Because without God, that's exactly what we are. When you have man first, that's called idolatry.
In other words, we're bowing to a bunch of dust. You know what I mean by that? When your family asks you, when your, your friends ask you, or when somebody, you come up with these doctrines, you listen to these people that say stupid things, you're yielding to a, to a, a dust pile because that's what we're made of. That's no different than wood or stone because that's what we're made of. And so we're, that's what we're trying to do here. Is we're trying to get in him. Yes, he is in us but we want to get in Him. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So don't be fooled by the ministers that are running around telling you, oh, we're all pleasing to God. Uh, only if you're getting in Him. If you're going to sit on the fact that He's in you and you think He's pleased with that, uh-uh. We need to yield to who He is. And we need to get in him. And so Paul got the revelation by just being and hearing his voice. And then he goes and he checks with the big guns. You know my teaching on that because that would be natural, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what you'd want to do. And he said, I found they added nothing to me. And that's why we've got all the books, the DVDs, and the CDs is because we want to shortcut it. We don't want to wait, eagerly wait for the righteousness that comes from God. We want to read a book and get it. I'm not saying God can't speak through books. He's got no choice. But tell me, how many more books do we need before we get in Him? Just asking. How many more? How many books do you think have been written about Christian stuff? What did poor old God do before the cell phone? Serious. Before the printing press. You ever had anybody criticize you for not taking notes? You ever heard people do that? What did they take notes on? They didn't. Why? Think they chiseled it out on stone as the guys were teaching? So evidently then it wasn't finished, right? And these guys couldn't, they couldn't reach perfection right At, right after when jesus said it's finished he really didn't mean that we really need the present the the uh the cell phone and the printing press invented before we could actually get to where we're in christ right no so that's what i mean we put man first you don't even realize you do it when people take that phone and immediately go to start telling people what's wrong pray for me who are you putting first you didn't go to God and wait for His righteousness. You immediately went to the phone. You immediately went out and bought the book, How to Be Set Free. Five steps. To, what was that one I told you? Three secrets to answered prayer. I can tell you three. I can give you one secret and save you 1995. Pray His will. And you'll get answered, pray your will, it won't. There, I saved you 1995. Find out what his will is. Get in him, and your prayers will be answered. Because your prayers won't be about you, they'll be about him. We all want to be out of pain. I understand that. I think there's everybody here probably in some kind of pain somewhere in their bodies. How many got pain? Let me see your hands. Yeah. <laughs> you don't right now, huh? <laughs> yeah. You, sometimes when you're sitting, you don't have any. But usually people have pain. Yet we all want free from it. But we're eagerly waiting the righteousness that comes from God because it'll be a lasting freedom. All the rest of this only lasts for a short time, and then they're right back where they started from. All these deliverances, they work great. It looks like there's a lot of religious activity going on, a lot of hoopla, a lot of hee and, and doing a lot of stuff. And then they go right back, and the next week, 
they're still in bondage. And I'm not saying God doesn't, he throws people, you know, there's demons that throw people into the fire. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm just saying we make a formula out of it. Why? Because we shortcut the righteousness of God. Because we're in a hurry and we want it now. And ministers will cater to your want or wanting it now. That's how they get lots of people into their church. They're going to give you what you want right now. You think, let, go try to get a big crowd that wants to eagerly wait for the righteousness of God. Just try it. Just try to get them to wait for a hamburger. How many of you that way? You ever gone into a restaurant and took them a while to serve you? Do we, see, do we have any complaining going on? Everybody's looking down at their laps again. Then try to preach to a church and tell them to eagerly wait for the righteousness that comes from God and see how far you get. <clears throat> There's not going to be a lot that are going to want to wait for that righteousness. They'll want to wait as long as they can for their attitude, yeah. But I'm talking about the righteousness of healing, the righteousness of finances, the righteousness of prosperity, waiting for his right, his right way of prosperity, his right way of healing. Go try to preach that in a church and see how long you last. That's why we're small. Why do you think people come in here and they leave as soon as they, as they recognize when they come in here and they hear me minister on that internet or in this church, they recognize this is going to be work. This is going to be work. This is going to cost me something. I'm actually going to have to wait for something. I don't want to wait. I want it right now. <clears throat> you think I'm wrong? Go to any of these churches in town here and preach till 2 o'clock and see how, long, how far you get. See how far you get. I want out, and I want out right now. That's where we're headed. And that's what we're trying to do. Is we're trying to obtain the righteousness, waiting, just like how many want to do justice immediately. You see somebody get wronged, what do you want to do? Huh? Are you thinking of God when you do that, or are you thinking of that person that you want to, ju that you want to do justice for? Now you're back to thinking of man again. It's right to want justice but we want to wait for God's righteousness judgment and righteousness way of doing things, the right way of doing it. Sometimes when people come in here new, that's one of the criticisms they have of Kathy and me, is we wait too long. It's true, isn't it? How many people wanted their stuff done right now? You guys wait too long. What do you think we're waiting for? What do you think we're waiting for? How many, how many ministries have tried this, that, and the other thing to try to get people ministered to, and it's cost people thousands of dollars, lots of hours, for nothing? That's why we wait. We're waiting for the righteousness of God. Did I make my point? What was it? Does anybody have anything? You remind, when we talk about waiting, 
I was reminded of the first time I started to make some wine. And I thought, boy, this is sure going to taste good. And oh, I just, you know, I was really eager. I read the books that I had. I got the stuff I needed. And I put it all together. It didn't come and become wine in one day. And I waited. And I waited for the change. And I waited. And I waited for the change. That first batch, just the first step, took two months. Sixty days. Then I had to move it over to the next container. Another 30 days. Then you could finally bottle it. Could you imagine waiting that long and having a thirst that you thought you couldn't quench? Well, it's the same way with God. You know, we all, especially me, I still know I need to learn more about waiting. But I remember when I retired, and I thought, oh boy, oh boy, I'm cut free. I don't have a job anymore. Well, you know, the Lord came along, and all of a sudden, I had a job. But I didn't know what I was doing, so I read the book, and I read the book, and I read the book, and I read the book. It's full of instructions. Did you know that? Uh -huh. Wow. So I read, and I waited, thinking, okay, something miraculous is going to happen. But then I happened to read a verse where he was talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees. They were asking for another sign. And it was like I got slapped across the face. Because I thought, is that what I'm waiting for? Another sign? Or do I already have every sign I need right here in this book if I will just read with the proper spirit and listen? <clears throat> it's a good scripture where they tried to get him to perform a sign. See, they were trying to get him to think of them instead of what God was saying. Easiest thing to do. And, uh, you know, you can be a good person. You can be, do all the right things. You can be nice. You can be friendly. You can speak to people. But that isn't necessarily the righteousness of God. Because if Jesus' heart was to <clears throat> set the captives free, that should be our heart as well. And we should always be looking <clears throat> for, you know, something to speak, something to say, listening for God's voice to speak to those people. And then you won't please men. Because they're going to take it as correction. And that's why the scripture says in there, consider yourself. When you, when you bring correction to people, lest you also be tempted, because you'll join in the argument as well. It's difficult to do. Anybody else? Always walk. When people speak to you, when you see things happening in the news, always walk. And, and, and with what you're seeing and what you're hearing... Is this designed to cause me to think of good, to think of man first? Or is this designed to make me think of God first? Okay. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Once again, cause us to walk this thing out. We're looking at this thing and it looks almost impossible. Because we've put ourselves first so much, we don't even recognize when we're doing it. 
We put other people first and we don't even recognize it. We're in it before we even know it. And Father, cause us to have the same discernment that Jesus did. That when anybody tried to get him to think of man first and not God, he caught it and addressed it. And Father, we thank you that that's where we're moving to. That's the distinction that we will have is we'll become distinct in putting God first and man second instead of the other way around. It's been man first for centuries, and we've even been taught that in church. But God, it's supposed to be you first and man second. And Father, we just thank you. That will be the distinction. That will be the persecution. That will be the difference. And Father, we need to be in you. We thankful. We're very thankful that you're in us. But we want to be in you. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Did you have something? Anything? I don't know. No? Not necessarily. Just a minute. We're, we're, we're thinking. Wait. Okay. We're done.